where was I? Okay, consumer and industrial IoT. Um, I think it's very important to separate the two because there's uh, some people who put numbers out there that are just huge, incomprehensibly large, and they combine these two areas and cause, uh, quite frankly, a lot of confusion. So we've got the consumer IoT driven mostly by personal interest, and you see on the left there some of the industries that I would categorize that for. And on the right, there's industrial IoT, uh, and again on, the, on your left, you'll see some categories for that. I think the consumer IoT is starting to exhibit some uh, Fed-like behavior. For example, the Fitbit folks are, they were doing really great a couple of years ago, but now they're starting to have a little bit of trouble. Uh, the cell phones, of course, will exist for a good long time, but in some of these areas, they're, they're actually silly, like uh, uh, the IoT fork and the IoT coffee cup. Those things didn't last too long. But the, the, on the right, the industrial stuff is driven by clear business value, which I will get to in the, in the course of these slides. All right. um, this study was done a couple of years ago. I, I would say today it's understated. Today there's uh, probably around 200 million devices out there that have an internet connection on them and can be incorporated into a uh, IoT uh, analytics type application. Now, the ones that are, are included in that number are listed on the right, but I'm sure there are far more beyond that. So this, there's a huge capability, not only for brand new equipment, that's the point of the slide, but there is brownfield opportunities too because uh, a lot of the equipment is already IoT capable. Uh, so I'm gonna start drilling in on maintenance management. Now, uh, Andy did use my, uh, my slides this morning in his presentation, so I'm not gonna repeat that, uh, but I'm gonna drill into another aspect of it. Uh, this slide has two aspects to it. One aspect has to do is, is to get some common language about what we mean in the maturity chart, what these terms mean, like condition-based maintenance, predictive maintenance, prescriptive maintenance. I did a survey of how people characterize uh, maintenance maturity, and it's all over the map. There is no consistency in terminology. So one aspect of this is an attempt by ARC to come up with some consistent terminology. And then the second aspect is to explain how the maturity model has expanded directly resulting from the industrial internet of things. Um, with, uh, and I like to use the car analogy on, on the right. So on the bottom reactive is the radio. We don't have any predictive maintenance for the radio. Some of you with, uh, with teenagers in the car may feel a little differently about how critical this asset is, but the, for the most part, it's a non-critical asset. Uh, we do preventative, replace the engine oil every 5,000 miles as an example. Uh, you get to, to condition-based. This is, in, in this definition, it's single variant. So we're talking about something like the oil light on your car. Uh, when that goes on, you need to pull off immediately, uh, add some oil, or you could suffer dire consequences to your engine. The engine sees and uh, you have a $5,000 repair. Um, and and in, in this context, we're talking now to find predictive is when there's multiple variant and analytics applied. And that's how the battery management systems work in electric cars. And the top one is prescriptive. When you start giving diagnostic information to the technician to guide them on the repair, and that's what we see in the uh, dealership level diagnostic equipment, all right? So this is uh, what I would call the maintenance maturity chart, asset performance management maturity chart, and I encourage people to use this terminology so we have a common set of terminology moving forward. And we welcome people to use this chart. Uh, you know, send me an email message if you want a, a PDF or a graphic of this chart, I'd be, be delighted to send, you, send it to you. All right. um, this chart, I'll give you the short form. The numbers on the left the, in, in the middle, the 30, 37, 10%, tell us where we are now. Uh, we did a survey, we asked maintenance managers what types of work orders they issue. That's why this doesn't add up to 100 because there's others beyond what's listed here. Um, 
And the dominant one is preventative maintenance. So I wanted to make a couple of points here. One is around if you move from preventative maintenance to predictive or condition-based maintenance, this is a study done by Shell, your maintenance costs on average are cut in half. And that has to do with labor and also MRO materials. And the reason is, is you're doing the maintenance when it is needed, at the point when an anomaly is found and we know that maintenance is required, rather than doing it when you anticipate something that, that could occur. I mean, you know, back in engineering school, I was schooled on this uh, bathtub curve. And the idea of predictive maintenance is you try to do it before the curve goes up. And you know, you're a little conservative about it. With condition-based and predictive maintenance and prescriptive maintenance, you do it when the equipment tells you it has a problem, when it's really needed. Uh, the second part, a uh, key point to bring up in this chart, is that 82% of assets have a random failure pattern. Now remember, you're doing predictive maintenance at the point where that curve goes up, all right? Well, if you have a completely random failure pattern, there is no up on this. So predictive maintenance, um, uh, preventive maintenance, excuse me, does not apply. So there's 82% of your assets, even if you were to do preventative maintenance, it would be inappropriate. And this study comes from UAL, is of course United Airlines. Uh, then uh, Broberg was a airline parts supplier out of Germany, all right? Uh, the US Navy, they did that for ships going above the ground, and the next one is for submarines. Now some of you may say, if you look at the dates, these are all old, they still apply. I would say it's probably even a greater extent because in that time frame, we've added more electronics, which has a random failure pattern, uh, more software, uh, embedded IT, which has a random failure pattern. So if anything, the 82% is understated with today's technologies and today's equipment. Right? So this makes a strong case for um, moving up that maturity curve. And the only way you can do it is with IoT, getting access to the data, analytics to analyze it and determine when things are uh, not working properly. Uh, and this, these analytics usually take two approaches. One is some engineered algorithm, and usually that's done by an OEM who really has a deep understanding of their equipment or uh, machine learning, and usually that's done by end users uh, because they can't uh, uh, basically afford to have all the engineering effort to, for you know, one or two pieces of equipment to create those algorithms, all right? So we see both algorithms typically for OEMs, machine learning typically by OEMs, I mean by end users, excuse me. All right. um, now, let me kind of bring this up a little bit. So I drilled into a uh, little bit of the, the why we need pre uh, predictive maintenance and, and prescriptive maintenance with IoT and, and uh, analytics. Now I'm going to move into the broader business processes. Uh, we in the uh, industrial sector have been doing big data and analytics for at least three decades that I know of, and that's with the historian. Now typically, though, the historian has been connected to the process control system. And most historians, not for technical reasons, just pragmatic reasons of what it was attached to, has process data in it. What's new with the Internet of Things is now we're bringing in equipment data, number one. We're usually putting that into a cloud infrastructure, which has a wide variety of analytics available. So we can get to more easily and you know, these platforms become repetitive. You can you develop an application. By repetitive, I mean more sustainable. You develop an application on a, on a platform, whatever you choose to use, and uh, that becomes one application. But it's easy to add additional applications so you can expand the m number of critical pieces of equipment that are covered by predictive and prescriptive maintenance. All right? But it doesn't do any good just to generate an alarm, an alert. 
Uh, I've heard too many case stories where somebody ge generates an alert and the equipment fails just as they predicted. Uh, that's not good. You need to do something with that alert. And in this broader business process, it's necessary to transfer that alert to somebody in the maintenance department. And I think the uh, recommended person would be the maintenance planner who can assess those alerts and decide which ones get converted into work orders. And of course, uh, the work orders then uh, get transferred to the maintenance department. Uh, hopefully they're using a mobile device to manage and process those work orders. This gets into having good data integrity in your EAM system so people trust it as a uh, planning, a proactive planning tool. And now it becomes a closed loop process from equipment to analytics, predictive maintenance, to alerts, to the maintenance planner, EAM system, to the maintenance technician, and back to the equipment. A closed loop process. And all us control engineers love closed loop processes. All right. Now, a lot of people talk about OTIT integration, and uh, uh, sometimes they don't drill in and define it. I just want to point out that this is a clear uh, case story example of the integration of operating technology and IT. Obviously, the operating technology here is the process control system. Uh, the alerts and flags are the uh, thing in between. It integrates it with the uh, IT systems. Your EAM, E in the EAM stands for enterprise. Uh, so we have a clear example here of the OT, IT uh, integration uh, that's going on. Now I'm just going to talk about the business benefits briefly. All right. So the idea is that we move from the uh, your right on this curve, where with high unplanned downtime and uh, uh, very low maintenance maturity, move from that red area into the green area with high maturity and near zero unplanned downtime, that dreaded, ugly unplanned downtime. Um, so I'm just going to, you know, what does that do? It clearly benefits the maintenance metrics like uptime, asset longevity, cost control. We've done surveys among maintenance managers. What are your metrics? And this is what comes back every time we've done the survey. Uh, and in rank ordered like this, safety more in the continuous process industries. When you get into discrete, usually that shifts over to quality and yield. All right. Uh, but it's uptime, asset longevity, cost control, being able to manage the uh, maintenance uh, department, safety, quality, yield. Now, I'm going to bridge that over to the executive metrics. The metrics of the C-suite are very obvious. They're clearly stated in the P&L statement and the balance sheet. So if we take uptime, with better uptime, i.e. no unplanned downtime, you have increased revenue because the equipment is able to make product. All right, uh, and you have better on-time shipments, which converts to higher customer satisfaction, which usually means more repeat orders. So uptime directly connects to the P&L statement. You know, revenue drives profits. If we look at asset longevity, and I'm just going to go through the first two here, asset longevity leads to cash conservation. When you, at your asset lasts longer, you don't need to go buy a new one. Uh, that means that the, uh, you can serve cash, which affects the, something called a quick ratio that financial analysts use to value the, the stock. So with a better quick ratio, the stock price goes up. All right? That's one aspect of that. Uh, and the other aspect of it is that your assets uh, continue at the depreciated rate. You didn't bring in new ones, so your, your assets have a low valuation. And uh, you can reduce WIP inventory. One of the reasons why you have work in process inventory is so that if you have unplanned downtime, the downstream equipment can continue to run. If you don't have much on down plan time, you can then reduce WIP inventory. Again, cash conservation improves the balance sheet. Let me just point out that by improving the uptime, you directly, from the C-suite perspective, affect profit. If you keep your assets, low valuation, that reduces the denominator, 
and your ROI is driven up by both cases. Obviously, this gets C-suite attention and um, improves shareholder value, which they love. So the caution I'm going to give those people justifying IoT projects is not the focus on margin. What people tend to do is focus on, well, as a result of doing this predictive maintenance, I will not need as many maintenance technicians. I'll need fewer MRO materials. That is an aspect of it. But quite frankly, from a C-suite viewpoint, that's going to be a low-level benefit. If you focus on ROA, revenue and on-time shipments, cash conservation, reducing WIP inventory, that will get C-suite attention. And when you get C-suite attention, you're going to get the resources you need to be successful, including management coverage. If, if some other department isn't being cooperative, you engage a senior management to, manager to fix that problem. And you're much more likely to have a successful project and can build on that success, not only from a viewpoint of additional projects, but your own career. All right.